We are here in Windy Fort Pierce, Florida, and we're taking a look at the ORA facility. So we're in the coral greenhouse at ORA. It's really impressive using natural sunlight. Only, yeah. Jordan's gonna kind of show us around, but first, how big is this? Like, how many gallons are in here? What you're looking at is 20,000 gallons of salt water. Wow, and is that salt water be synthetically made or pulled in from no, the ocean? No, we're very fortunate being this close to the ocean that we're actually able to draw up water from a saltwater well. That is awesome. Let's yeah. take a look around. All right, come on in. So as you can see, everything we do here is illuminated by the Florida sunshine. Very bright, year-round, 365 days a year. Uh, a lot of our frags here are not the traditional frags you would think of, where you take a mother colony, you cut up a bunch of pieces, and sell those as frags. We're actually making frags of frags of frags of frags. <laughs> so, I mean, here's a great example of that. Uh, obviously here we've got a number of our uh, very popular pieces. Ice Tort, Turquoise Stag, Red Planet, Verde, uh, pink bird's nest. Wow. Yeah, these are those highly sought after ones. Some of these are. ones, yeah. Every system you see here is filled with very similar looking arrangements. Uh, again, completely illuminated by just the sun, no artificial LEDs. Uh, and so they, these frags grow and then you frag them. Correct. Continue to just do the generation yes. of them. Some of these frags have been in constant production since the early 80s. Wow. Awesome. So we have all these big bats here, chock full of coral, and some big old sunks I see here. Tell me a little bit how this is set up. All right, come on down, I'll show you. So in addition to light, one of the other main important things with growing any kind of coral is water movement. So as you can see, we've got gigantic uh, flow of water to really pound this system with a lot of water movement, get rid of any detritus, get these corals growing uh, as naturally as possible. From here, the water is transferred into these uh, growing trays, and there, we could put pumps in every single one, right? But that would be a lot of electrical usage if every single tank had multiple power heads. So what we utilize are these Carlson surge devices. Uh, this is a really easy way to get a lot of water flow in a small space with very little electrical usage. It looks like trash cans. I don't understand. I don't get it. <laughs> I know. It's a weird, it, it's almost like magic how it works. The okay. water will fill up the channel here. It breaks the siphon similar to how a toilet flushes. Okay. And you get an entire surge of 32 gallons of water blasting through here and all the branches of the coral. Wow. Okay. And is all, does each of these do that? So it's getting three different surges? Yes, all day long, right. Wow. So when you have all that water flow, uh -huh. uh, in a home setting, all these coral frags would just get blown away by the or by the flow. Right. So we don't glue these down, obviously, to where we're growing. And so what we have to do is be uh, very careful, which is why we engineered this. Oh. This is our uh, exclusive ORA plug. Okay. The bane of many hobbyists. We get it. We, we know you don't like it. You can't cut it. You can't saw it in half. But for us, it's very useful. It's steel, it, it slides in very nicely okay. uh, into a crate. And then it stays there. So what you can do is actually take these coral trays out of the water. You can turn them upside down. Oh. And the corals will stay put. Okay, so there's a reason the rubber long plugs Yes. Are a thing. They have um, to. They ha otherwise the water would just blow all of these out. If you had the shorter plugs. If they were loose. Yeah. These actually fit so snugly in these quarter inch holes of acre that they won't move. Okay. That makes sense. I never knew that of why you had the black rubber plugs That's out right. there. All right, so this might be the largest anemone I've probably ever seen. What is this one? It's so pretty. Ah, uh, this is one of my favorites. This is a Heteractus magnifica. Okay. The Ritteri is the uh, common nomenclature, even though it's incorrect. <laughs> um, this is kind of the quintessential clownfish anemone uh, that you normally see in all the nature videos. This is about wild size, too. I mean, they can get up to three feet in diameter. That thing is so big. And you can see another one down there. So, yeah, then the we've got- The guys hanging out on it. We've got, actually, that's a bubble tip anemone. Oh, what? We've got condylactis, actually right there in the corner. Wow. So these sumps, while filled with a lot of our larger, more uh, horizontal corals, uh, also become kind of a home for pets. But we also do a lot of our 
captain rearing from systems like this. Oh, okay. Uh, the Bengay Cardinals, for example, uh, the Mandarins used to be spawned in these systems. Wow. I got to say, this bird's nest is huge. I can't tell where it really ends, but it looks absolutely beautiful. You're is this like the sour apple? Or? Uh, this is actually our green Stylophora. Oh, looks like a bird's nest. I was wrong. Very similar. There is a green bird's nest uh, elsewhere, but yeah, you'll notice a lot of these colonies are very large. We do let them grow out, uh, mainly as a uh, for emergency use only. Okay, so they don't get messed with, it's just here to be. I mean, we do, when they get too big, we have to cut them, we have to prune them, otherwise right. they would fill this entire system. Wow, you have some very large colonies in these subs over here. So yeah, this right here is our Maxima squamosa hybrid. We got a small batch of these through at our farm maybe like six years ago. Uh, this is the best one. Man, it is awesome. That thing is so beautiful. So it's going to get way larger than a regular Maxima book that has the color on them. Right, so some of the defining features, you definitely can see the mantle is very squamosa, very large yeah. flowing sides, uh, but the color is very Maxima. That's very, that's awesome. That's got to be a very sought after plant if you could ever get a hold of it. Uh, Everyone wants to buy that. Everyone wants to buy that. <laughs> Alright, so we've looked at a lot of like hard SPS type corals, but you guys also, of course, have some soft ones. We um, do. This vat's kind of full of it's a pretty cool view. What do you all have all going in here? Yeah, so I mean, obviously we, we grow stuff for the entire range of the aquarium hobby. Uh, you're right. As super hard, uh, more delicate SPS, but also some of the more uh, easy to do soft corals. So we've got some of our electro green singularias. We've got toadstools, uh, zoanthids, uh, and one of our newer corals, astro spicularia. Say awesome. that four times fast. Yeah, no, I'm good, I'm good. Um, uh, and then also <laughs> the quintessential zinnia. I like this, I think that's pretty cool looking just because like, if you, it's just a bucket of zinnia basically. Right. And it's just really cool. Everyone loves zinnia. It's very, it can be invasive, but it's really a cool addition to it. It's one of those weird Aquarium. corals where, uh, you're right, some people say that it just takes over their tank, but other people can't grow it at all. And it it's is. still very popular. It ships poorly uh, from the wild. So this is one of your, the best alternatives. That's awesome. Um, so you got a little bit of everything for everybody. Yes. And a little sneak peek, the world's largest clam right there. What? Well, on its way to be. <laughs> <laughs> How big is it? What is this one? What is it going to get? So this is your Gigas clam. Okay. It'll get uh, four feet. Wow. About as tall as you. <laughs> hey! <Aww. laughs> well, okay, talking about clams, this one is really huge. It's like, big. It's one of it's the right. biggest ones I've seen. We don't really get a chance to see large clams like this in a home aquarium a lot of times. Um, is this one going to get bigger? This is about as big as they get. Okay, uh, it's beautiful. This, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's very hardy. Uh, this is one of the best clams for the home aquarium, at least to start out with. Yeah. Yeah, very, um, very forgiving. And it's got the nice blue colors to it. It's got some cool patterns. Oh, intense colors, absolutely. Um, these sumps are just really impressive. There's so many big colonies in here. Big old skimmer. I don't even, how big is that thing? Like. What is that, eight feet, 10 it's feet? Like eight, 10 feet 30 feet, I don't know. <laughs> Running these, you know, running but, off of natural sunlight. It's really impressive. Right. Um, you know, the corals are just so happy and you've got so much going on in Thank here. Thank you. Yeah, and at the end of the day, we really are taking care of these much like a home aquarist would. We've yep. got a skimmer, we've got lighting, we've got water motion. Yeah. And in some cases, we actually have uh, chillers to keep the water cool. Yeah, so you're saying that these big old units outside are not AC units. Right, these that's are not keeping chillers. it nice and cool in here. That is keeping the water nice and cool, uh, keeping this. Florida sun at bay. Yeah, being in Florida in the middle of summer, it's got to get a little bit tricky. It is so, awesome. Um, looks awesome over here, Jordan. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Something a bit new from Murray that a lot of people might not realize is sharks. So we are here in Shark farm? We shark thought? nursery, yeah. Shark, shark nursery. Um, we're going to check out some cool stuff going on. Epaulette sharks. Yes. One of the best sharks for the home aquarium, uh, in my mind, because they stay relatively small. And I say relatively because they do get up to 36 inches, but in comparison to some of your other shark species, uh, they actually stay much, much smaller. So would, say, an epaulette be pretty fair in like our like LX? 
320.7, like a 7 foot 30 inch would be okay in there. And you could easily start one off in there for quite some time, particularly okay, awesome. as a small, super adorable shark pup. Oh, do you have any shark pups to see? Currently, we only have shark eggs. Okay. But we can show you those. All right, so in here, is it one pair of sharks? Is it groups of them? Like, how are these all kind of broken up? So, yeah, you've got multiple harems. One male, several females, uh, different species of epaulette sharks. Okay. Your regular epaulette, your speckled carpet shark. These guys happen to be one of my favorites. Their patterns are beautiful. What the other one got? Yeah, what did the other one got? Check out this adorable shark. I love sharks. The epaulettes are really cool. They have beautiful pattern. And um, really remarkable animals, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, these are found in tide pools. So they can deal with a wide range of conditions. Super hot water, super cold water, no oxygen. They can crawl out of water. Uh, they're actually called walking sharks. Wow. They can actually do something crazy like turn off their half their brain for four hours in the absence of complete zero oxygen. Wow, so extremely hardy. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good shark for people who've never had one, have a big enough aquarium. Um, and they're absolutely beautiful. Um, how about shyness? Are they very shy? As far as I know, a lot of sharks tend to hide a lot in aquariums. They are. They're a little bit shy. I mean, they okay. like to uh, kind of hang out in little caves. But oh, man, hi. when it comes to feeding, they are ready to party. They're ready to party. So this one's more of a spotted. This would be your regular epaulette. Yep. Okay. Very cool. He's, that one seems like he's got a lot of personality. Uh, he is to ready. Say hi. All right, we got eggs to see. Yeah. So we've got eggs. We got the dates they were laid. Uh, oftentimes they're called mermaid purses. So how long do they stay here when they're laid until you get a little pup? A surprisingly long amount of time. Uh, <laughs> I think it's somewhere around six to seven months. Oh, wow. Uh, they hatch out. They look like little salamanders. They are adorable. Wow. So it's six to they're just hanging here. You don't have to do anything but keep water going. So one of the things that we like to do is make sure they're eating on their own. Okay. Uh, so we essentially are hand feeding these until we feel they're comfortable enough uh, being ready to be sold. Okay, Usually around hatch. six to eight inches. Wow, okay. We got no babies at the moment. No, I'm be sorry. Coming. But That's soon. a long process. Next, next, it is. Yeah. All right, so what do we have in here? Uh, these definitely look a little bit bigger, not quite the same pattern as epaulets. What are these guys? So you'd be incorrect in saying bigger. These actually stay smaller. Oh, they're just fatter. They are, <laughs> right. So these are our short tail nurse sharks. They top oh. off at about 24 inches. Uh, Super charming, really cool. They've got a very unique behavior where they will sleep on their back. Whoa. So you'll okay. come out here sometimes, your heart will drop. You'll be like, oh no, they're gone. But it, they just sleep on their back. It's okay, very so you weird. said nurse shark and 24 inches in one sentence. Yeah. Like how is it, is like a dwarf? Uh, yeah, well, exactly, a short tail nurse okay. shark. So uh, most short uh, nurse sharks in the wild, five, eight, 10 mm -hmm. feet long. These guys top off around 24. Probably these one are suitable for the home aquarium. I would say probably these are the best sharks for the home aquarium. Wow, you could have your very own nurse shark in your house if you had a large enough aquarium. Absolutely. That's too cool, I've never seen one. Look how cute they are. All right, so we've made it over to the broodstock building. This is where all the magic happens with the fish. Um, so this is the first step. This is where they're breeding. Correct, yeah. So what you got going on in here? There's it seems like we've got a lot of fish and a lot of tanks. This is one of the most important buildings in our entire facility. This is where every pair, every clownfish that somebody buys originated from the parents in this building. Aww. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so about how many pairs of fish do you have in here? Well, we have probably over 1,400 individual pairs of fish. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of babies happening. It's a lot of fish to take care of. <laughs> okay. They get fed the best food. The water is the top most clean. Uh, the best care happens in this building. Awesome. So I see we got different tanks for all the different fish and their stuff. Is everything here like egg laying? I yes. know clownfish are egg laying. Is Absolutely. That here, I'll kind of that? show you a little bit of, of what it looks like. So you'll notice that all of our fish have tiles. Mm -hmm. uh, this right here is a really special signal. This means there are eggs on those tiles. Oh, the green mean eggs, okay. So a lot of your clownfish will lay eggs roughly about every two weeks on a pretty rigid cycle. Wow. Uh, from egg to hatching, you're looking at about eight, eight to nine days. Um, and that's that part after 
after here is handled by a completely different department. Okay. So I also see, we have clown fish in here, but I see some cardinals, we some cardinals, gobies, right. that kind of stuff. So no matter what type of fish it is, this is where the breeding happens. Yes, yes. Okay. So some of my favorites, uh, obviously we've got black storms, we've got some gold nugget maroons, and one of my favorite fish to show you uh, is one of the original Picasso clownfish to ever get into our industry. Oh, okay, so he was one of the beginnings of the Picasso line for you guys. Absolutely. So these guys right here, every Picasso that's come into our uh, industry, the very first designer clownfish, for mm -hmm. example, yeah. came from a fish wild collected just like this. Aww, okay. So they all, they all come in wild, then you work through the generations and reproducing, but Absolutely. those wild pairs stay as that. But this is what started yeah. the entire designer clownfish wow. phenomenon. One so, of the reasons why we're here today. Speaking of designer clowns, so you have fish that comes in with a cool pattern. Sure. And then you kind of work with that there is There's a lot of fancy genetics that goes yes. into uh, figuring out what's going to look good. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes you'll start with two patterns, you'll put them together. What comes out may be completely different. Yep. Uh, it could be just a wild type fish that comes out. Uh, we are actively looking through all of our uh, grow out tanks to find aberrant patterns okay. that may breed true and become like the next big Might be, that's designer. how you get the next type of right. pa pattern or whatever. And then you have designer clowns breed, are all the babies a designer? No. No. So Sometimes, it's not like you just have Picassos and you got Picassos all over the place. You may have 25% that are Picassos and 25% that are wild, uh, wild type. Okay. Another 25% that looks something different. I mean, it just depends on the genetics that's inside every clownfish. Very cool to know. Awesome. So what would you say is probably one of the harder types of fish in your breeding to really get, right to get going? Yeah. Uh, some of the damselfish species are really, really tricky. Okay. Um, we've got uh, firefish that we have tried that have also been very challenging. Firefish, uh, okay. Comets or betas, marine oh, betas. Yeah. Okay. We've, we'll hold onto pairs for sometimes 10 years plus just hoping they'll do something. Wow. But the other flip side of that is sometimes the spawning is the easy part. Okay. We can get these clownfish, we can get some of these uh, cardinals or gobies to spawn, uh -huh. but then getting the fry into a adulthood. Whole another process a whole of new set of challenges. Very cool. But clownfish seems to be pretty once they get going, they're pretty regular. They are, they're pretty you easy to go. That process Absolutely, really well. yes. Awesome. So here we are in the ORA pack house. Can you guys tell us a little bit more about what happens here in this building? Absolutely. Donna? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so this is actually a very unique building uh, in our facility. It's one of, it's actually the only building that houses species from our hatcheries, our coral greenhouse, as well as our Marshall Island clam facility. So all of these systems are actually unique to our Marshall Island facility. Um, whenever we get a Marshall Island shipment in, which is generally uh, two times a month, um, everything gets staged in these troughs as well as the troughs in the back of the building. Uh, that includes our SPS, our LPS, as well as our clams. Um, so any clams that come from ORA are staged in this building, um, ready to be shipped to either your door or to your local fish store. So as far as shipments, um, we do multiple shipments every day, um, upwards to 500 um, different stores um, in one single day sometimes. And all of them are individually bagged. We don't generally do a bulk packing of any of our animals. Um, we want them to be able to transition from our systems into the home aquarium as safeguarded as possible. So every single fish and coral something like this would be individually bagged based on the species and we heat seal the packages or we clip the bags that way we're ensuring the best possible um, air quality as possible um, and making sure that they arrive with air still on the bags. So we get a wide variety of livestock from our clam farm not just clams we're going to be raising soft corals like singularias, leathers, mushrooms, zoanthids, uh, in addition to our clams, uh, acropora and monopores as well. These are all kept here completely separate from our coral greenhouse, uh, strictly for biosecurity reasons. 
So in this building specifically, we have two different uh, variations of holding systems that we bring all of our fish and inverts into prior to shipping. So this cube system here, uh, as well as the troughs, we generally utilize this for heavy bulk um, and heavy quantity fish. So generally our international shipments are staged in these areas as opposed to our glass systems, which most of our domestic uh, retailers and our local fish stores would utilize. So we work a lot with invertebrates that are very beneficial for the home aquarium. Uh, for algae control particularly, we raise multiple species of urchins from the very popular tuxedo urchin to the variegated urchin as well. Very, very good at what they do to keep your home aquarium clean. the grow out building and we have as far as you can see vats of absolutely adorable baby fish before fish. they go off to their new homes tell us a little bit about this place right so this is uh, one of the last stages before we should bring them to our shipping building uh, these animals here start off as very very tiny little larvae they're brought into these big troughs they're fed four to six times a day uh, to really get them as big as possible so <clears throat> so say you bring it in clownfish over here from the larva stage. How long, roughly, and I know it's probably gonna depend, is a clownfish over here from that right. larval stage until it's ready to go and be shipped out? It can be anywhere between six to nine to 12 months wow, before okay. a fish is ready to go. So there's living in here, getting the best life, oh, lots man. of food, lots of they're great care. They're getting the tank scrubbed every day, <laughs> they're getting fed all the time, new water changes, natural sunlight. This is where you'd wanna be if you were a fish. So the water changes in here has gotta be pretty, heavy, I would think, because with all of these babies, I mean, I don't know how many, is it thousands that are in here? Like, yeah, tens of thousands, tens absolutely. Of thousands. Uh, They're getting fed constantly. There's got to right. be a lot of work for a water quality upkeep. We do a lot of water movement. We do a lot of heavy filtration, a lot of biological filtration okay. to really get rid of all that nutrients in the water. Yeah, that's a lot of, lot of fish food and all that going in there. But they're so cute. And in each of these systems, it's not one particular type of fish no, or clownfish. No, you'll oftentimes see a mix of multiple different types of designer clowns, wild type uh, patterns. Okay. Rarely is it multiple species, but sometimes we do. So you just kind of take a lot of different hatching sets, and then as they get bigger, you start to divide them out by their right. type? Yep, we can grade okay. them by their pattern, their size, the species. Uh, makes it easier for the team that works here to get them over to our shipping building okay. uh, when they know what we're shipping out that day. Okay, so this is where they stay until they move over to the shipping building exactly, when they go yep. out of there. They look very happy. We have a lot of sizes. I've seen, we got thotty backs, clownfish, oh, right. cardinals. Damsels, absolutely. Damsels. Some of my favorites here, the orchid dotty back. Uh, this fish absolutely glows in the dark under our natural sunlight here. Yeah, I had to stop when I was walking by here just because of the brightness of the orchid dotty back, but also, um, the good blue guys that are in here, they are like almost iridescent. Ah, one of our hybrids, the electric indigo dotty back, absolutely. I love them. Like when they turn, they all have different kind of phases of the color. Um, dotty backs can be a little bit more aggressive. Right, so I would like to say, I mean, dotty backs all, oftentimes get people a little nervous, but the orchid dotty back is probably the least obnoxious fish you can have in the home aquarium. Are they because they're aquacultured less aggressive than you would think a wild mm, ones? Maybe at some level, but really they're just not nearly as mean as okay. uh, some of their other cousins are. So your organ dotted back is your best bed in a more peaceful environment. I like to have um, one in every home tank I set up. They're, and they're just striking, beautiful color. It has been awesome to see how it's all done here at ORA, all the beautiful fish and corals. Cannot wait until we can put this into our all-in-one peninsula bill going on right now. So we want to thank you guys so much for having us here. It was amazing. I want to tell you guys at home, make sure you check out orafarm.com and also ask your retailer if they don't already to reach out to ORA so that they can bring the, their uh, corals and fish into their stores. Yeah, and on behalf of Donna and myself, thank you so much for coming out here. We love yeah. showing off what we do and uh, we hope to work with you again soon.